A fish out of water is someone who feels out of place because their surroundings are not suitable for their designed purpose. The Burmese python is out of place in Florida, but unfortunately, it's perfectly comfortable. Sometimes an animal thrives in an environment that groans under the weight of its presence. But flourishing where you don't belong is a great way to upset the balance of life, death, and taxonomy. Welcome back to Life, Death, and Taxonomy. It's your 30 minutes of interesting animal information. I'm Joe. And I'm Carlos. Thank you to Cassie for the creation of our theme song. To hear more of Cassie's music, please search Cassie Michelle on YouTube or Spotify. And thank you to Johanna for the creation of this week's artwork. To check that out, you can visit us at our home on the web at ldtaxonomy.com. And a very special thank you to our patrons, to Jesse Raspolich, Carol Raspolich, and Richard Kaspar. Thank you so much for your support. It's greatly appreciated. Thanks for helping us keep the lights on. And today we're talking about a reptile who's coming in our state and taking all our rabbits. Trying to eat them, so y'all better hide your <laughs> hogs. <laughs> Hide your bobcats. <laughs> they're they're they've infiltrated. We're talking about the Burmese python. Yeah, I didn't I didn't write that down. I had to come up with that on the spot. Me too. So we I got a little you were political. Do the Antoine Dobson joke. So yeah, political political Antoine Dobson. Uh, things are gonna sound weird because you're thundering and I am cold, so it's gonna sound funny. Can you hear the thunder now? The, the, I is, did hear some thunder, yes. Yeah. I I am just thundering. I am electric right now. Oh, good. Boogie, woogie, woogie. But yeah, it's the Burmese python. We're going to call it here the mouthy python. And slither hugs. Very good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Playing Hogwarts Legacy, so Slytherin is on the mind, even though I'm I chose Hufflepuff. <clears throat> because I like things that are average. <laughs> that was a, a little tangent, but let's uh, let's bring it right back by taxonomizing the snake. Okay, it's in the kingdom you know, love, and are in the Animalia, of course. The phylum is Chordata. It's got a spine. The class is Reptilia by the strokes. The order is Squamata, kind of like lizards. The suborder is Serpentes, unlike lizards. The family is Pythonidae, so pythons. The genus is Python, also pythons. And the species is Bivitatus, which we're going to go right back to talk, saying that it sounds like a Harry Potter spell. Only if it was Pythonus Bivitatus, but that brings, so it's, yeah, Python Bivitatus, Brings me to my new favorite part of the show, a nitty gritty nomenclature. It's my new favorite part of the show because I can almost always do it. Critter Groups was great, but now that we have done several uh, species within these larger categories of things like snakes and fish and frogs, we're, it, it's, it's run its course for the most part. Unless we do a bird, because those guys know how to venery, if you know what I mean. Yes. Um, the ichthyologists, however, they are they did not they do not care. It is Sco schools and pods. Sc school schools shoals, and yeah, pods for whales. I, I mean, that's really, not, pods is not even ichthyology. No, it's not. Uh, so, Cetaceology. <laughs> even though there's so many different kinds of fish. They just, they, they can't be bothered. <laughs> Honestly, maybe I am team fish because maybe the fish people are like, terms of venery are stupid and we don't need them. But it's fun. You get to make up a fun word for the, a group of something. You have, there, there, there's a kind of fish called a Jew fish. You don't want to have fun with naming the group of those. No. There's a group of fish <laughs> called a grouper. Go, go, go wild. Have fun. It's already a, th a group of groupers sounds the f the funnest. 
I, I don't know. I just maybe maybe that this is my calling. Yeah, I, I'm. I'll, I'll happily get paid to just have people put a picture of a fish in front of me, and then I come up with the name for it. <laughs> <laughs> the, I mean that that is the that was that was the first job anybody had. That was Adam's job that's to true, look at animals and name them. <laughs> We Weird. do name the animals. We don't need to name the group or groups of them. Yeah, well, I mean, we that's already, already have done. words for that. Groups. The group <laughs> groups. Of them. All right, but we can't do critter groups because we've already done snakes. But we can do nitty gritty nomenclature, and we've got Python bivitatas. So this is the part of the show where I ask you, Joe, a question, and that question is, what is the binomial nomenclature in English. How is that translated? Python bivitatus. Now, I think this one's going to stump you. Is it A, long snake, B, big snake, C, brown snake, or D, double-banded snake killed by Apollo? More like I'll have you long shanks. I, if it weren't for subtitles, I would have never known that's what he said. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with Apollo, I guess. I mean, how, that's correct. How did you know? How did you figure that out? Why didn't you? I almost didn't choose it because, like, surely you would have done similar long, weird things. It was the, the act. Well, what I have to do first is figure out what it means. And the answer is bivitatus means double banded. And python is the Greek name for a, the, like the Greek proper name for a snake killed by Apollo. And so putting that together in something that makes English sense was double banded snake killed by Apollo. It's like, so, I mean, I could either go A, <laughs> um, you know, long fanged snake killed by Zeus B uh muscly snake killed by Hermes <laughs> just like the, yeah I like it seemed, it seemed kind of dumb so you could have left Python Python just like that so, the, Python is its own thing well I figured you would Python I would hope I, I hope that you would think that Python is saying I wasn't trying to st stump you with this one for once I threw you a bone Good, good, good. Well. Let's talk about what this guy looks like. It's a big, thick snake. Massive constrictor snake with a long, thick, muscular body and a relatively small triangular head. I'm not saying it's small. It's just relatively small. When you compare it to, like, a pit viper that has a massive head compared to its body, um, the, the uh, constrictor snakes tend to have smaller heads. Uh, its body is covered in a linear series of large brown uh, asymmetrical blotches lined with black and separated by uh, tan or yellow gaps. So kind of like almost giant leopard spots. Uh, these are for good camouflage and pattern disruption because nature hates its straight lines. So you can't have straight lines on you. There ain't no straight lines on me. They have multiple rows of up to 120 backward-facing teeth to lock in prey once they've snapped their jaws shut. And speaking of jaws, like many snakes, they can unhinge those bad boys to allow it to sw uh, swallow prey that's much larger than its head size. Um, but like I said, this is, a, this is one of the biggest snakes in the world. So... How big is it? Great question. Welcome to the beloved Measure Up segment, the official listener's favorite part of the show, the part of the show when we present the animal size, the dimensions, and relatable terms through a quiz that's fun for the whole family. It's also part of the show that's introduced by you when you send an audio yourself saying singing or hissing. The words of Measure Up into LDTaxonomy at gmail.com. We don't have a new Measure Up intro this week, so that means we get to hear from a python. And Carlos says to guess what it is. Ooh. Oh, do I get to uh, guess who it is? Do you want to pre-guess? Because you've been pretty on the money. So. Yeah, that was pretty on the mark. 
Ah, uh, man, I don't know too many pythons. I'm going to go with Sir Hiss. Sir Hiss is a good guess, but let's see if you're right. Or is it, oh, no, is it, oh, it's probably Ka. Also a good guess. Let's see if you're right. Yep, it's Ka. Hi, I'm Ka. Oh, you chose the Scarlett Johansson Ka. Don't be scared. I'm not gonna hurt. Yeah, that's Scarlett Boa Hansen. Except she's Python. That seems pretty good. That movie's pretty good. Yeah, it's the best of the remakes, I'd say. But I thought you were gonna choose the the original movie had I think the actor for Winnie the Pooh did the voice for Ka. Yes, he did. Yeah. So it's just such so weird hearing this uh like elderly warm charming voice from this slithering serpent. Uh No, I didn't do that one because I knew you were going to guess it. So Yeah, that the I had to put I, a twist on it. Sir Hiss was, I don't, I'm not sure that he was even a python, so. No, I don't think so. He was probably some sort of adder, like an English snake. Well, the um, King John calls him all kinds of things. He's a pernicious python, uh, cowardly cobra. He's, he just likes his uh, alliterations, even if he's way off on his taxonomy. Maybe a barred grass snake. Uh, let's talk about length. Let's talk about love. Let's talk about length. There are five meters they can be, or sixteen feet. Uh, that that's that's a lot. That's the upper end of average for sure. I think like. What is typical is like four to six feet for adults. Four to six feet? I was saying average was 12. Yeah, yeah. But like what I say average, it's like the, the majority. Of, like if you take the average of all of them, because reptiles grow until they die. The average of all of them is probably going to be somewhere in the middle. Well, uh, I, I was saying. Things are, start out really small. Then once they get that, like once they reach, leave the juvenile stage. There's, I, there weren't really any that were like less than 10 feet or something like that. If I was looking at it right. Really? But they can get much larger. Uh, the, the, the biggest on record in, I think, at all, but maybe just in Florida, is 19 feet. Uh, but obviously, like, uh, there's rumors of... We've seen the infamous 20 footers, 20 plus feet. The green anaconda apparently can get up to t almost 30 feet. That is, that is t that's too big. Yeah. The longest snake in the world, I think is the anaconda, but the biggest snake in the world, like in, g in girth bulk is, is our, is our friend, the Burmese Burma. Bur Bur Burmese Sanders. Oh, why didn't I put that in there? <laughs> uh, so how many cult pythons with the largest available barrel length go into the length of the Burmese python? We're looking for barrel length. Cult pythons. I don't know that one. Here's it. The cult python was first released by cult manufacturing uh, in 1955. The revolver boasts precision adjustable sights, a smooth trigger, solid construction, and extra metal for added durability. And it fires a 35.7. How do you say this? 0. 0.357? 357. Magnum. 357 Magnum. Yep, 357 Magnum. I know it's like with guns, it's always going to be different. I hate talking about the caliber. Yeah, uh, it, is in, it is absolutely bonkers how calibers and weights are described in gun culture it's just fix it 
but I could say the same thing about the imperial system. So whatever, we're not he- we're not here to make it easy. Yeah. The oh, so that you said you didn't, you said you didn't hear of this. It's because it was discontinued in two thousand. But I thought I saw that it was like re restarted again. But I'm not sure. I, I haven't heard of it either. I'm gonna assume that it is three inch barrel. That's pretty standard. I like how the description is we added extra metal for durability. <laughs> it's like, ah, this car is really unsafe, but we added some extra metal to it so that now it's, it's safe. <laughs> uh, so I'll give you a, another hint. There's one, two, three, four, five, six barrel length variants. And we're going with the longest one. Oh, oh. That is helpful. Not necessarily standard. They have some of those like pistols that have just or the revolvers with comically long barrel lengths. And maybe Well, we're not going with like the custom job. This is like the longest available to buy from Colt. Uh, I think four inches is probably upper end of standard. The, my answer is 48 on the dot. 48 flat. Sharp. Final? Yes. The correct answer is 28.5 Colt Python barrels. It's long, boy. The longest barrel of the Python was 8 inches. That is a long pistol barrel. <laughs> Yeah, they come in 2.5, 3, 4, 4 and a half, 6, and 8. Try to appendix carry that thing, and it's going to go through your femoral artery. Yep. Sounds fun. It's a, it's a, it's a mag, it's a 357, so it's going to like blow off a good chunk of your leg while you do it. No, it doesn't even have to go off. Just having it there just requires it to be in your leg. It's too long. <laughs> It's just, it's holster is your inner thigh. Not, not super practical. I can see why they discontinued an eight inch barrel, a revolver with an eight inch barrel. Well, they had a three inch, like you said, I'm looking at a picture of the four inch and it looks normal. It looks like a big Magnum gun, the four inch version. Yeah. It turns out you don't get that much more uh, of a benefit. From having just a substantially longer barrel like that, it's it is it is more uh, accurate and faster, but not by enough to justify having an eight-inch barrel on your revolver. <laughs> just a most of a ruler taped to the end of your gun. <laughs> uh, let's talk about weight there. 75 kilograms or 165 pounds, but they can be up to like 200 pounds. Uh, so how many pythons go into the weight of the fruiting body of the, hold on, Felinus El, Elpsoideus. Which is a mushroom, a fungus among us. Yeah, I don't want to know about anything's fruiting body. Felinus ellipsoideus. So we're talking about mushrooms, which are the fruiting body of a fungus. Did you know that? That's what a mushroom is. It's just the... So when you see a mushroom, there's really just... That's just a an appendage of a m- much bigger organism beneath the surface yeah Ugh. the ellipsoideus is native to hainan island in the south china sea you're asking me how many of these uh pythons go into this mushroom into the weight of this mushroom yep well you haven't so you know this mushroom is big okay i must know bigger than 165 pounds you're not gonna do uh a... oh the answer is point zero one 
<laughs> or whatever. Who could say? You haven't done it to me yet, I don't think, so this would be a first. I'm going to go ahead and uh, use some charitable judgment. Um, that's a big mushroom. Uh, mushrooms are weird, and I don't like them. One that's uh, 165 pounds is worse. I'm going to say one. One to one. A 165 pound mushroom. I think you fight one of those in Dark Souls, so we're going to go with that. Final answer? Yeah, 165, or one is my answer. The correct answer is 6.6. <laughs> this mushroom can weigh up to 500 kilograms or 1,100 pounds. What? I have got to see a picture of this thing. I have not been able to find... It's like the kind that, like, uh, it's like a shell, tree shelf kind. So I've been seeing a picture of one that looks crazy. This is like the kind of mushroom you jump on in a platforming game. Are you? Am I looking at the one that looks like uh, you could build a house on it? In it? Yeah. See, I never believe these pictures. Because there's so many pictures on the internet of like, look at this fish and it's like 40 feet long or something like that. And it's obviously photoshopped. Well, we have it on good Wikipedia authority that they can be a thousand pounds. Okay, I see one that looks a little bit more legit than that that other one. Um, man, if you were just walking through the forest and you saw this thing, that'd just be so weird. It's like this. I just feel like it was gonna chase me or something. I don't. I don't know. It's just so so. Uh, it looks so unnatural. I don't know. I'll, sh I'll show it to you later. That's fake. That's got to be fake. That's like a portobello that somebody blew up. Yeah, the portobello one looks fake, but there's another one that looks less fake. Anyway, I am... I don't like it. Mushrooms are weird. They're, they're eating whatever they're attached to. It's not like a normal plant. <laughs> okay. That's that. Do you have any fast facts before we get into the thick python-sized fact? I sure do. So, uh, obviously, the Burmese python is native to Burma, but it's also its natural range extends throughout Southeast Asia, including Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, Myanmar, Nepal, Bhutan, Bhutan, Bhutan. I'm not to pronounce that one. Uh, China, Taiwan, India, and even some sports. No, some spots in Malaysia. Grammarly did not catch that. Uh, it loves swampy marshlands with lots of water. Uh, it is a great swimmer. Can stay underwater for up to half an hour. Um, and it can also climb trees and has a prehensile tail. And if you don't remember what prehensile means, it means that it can control it like, uh, and like we control our fingers. Um, it's not like a, a dog. A dog's tail is not prehensile. Um, where like a, a monkey's is. Um, and since it can climb trees and swim really well, you are not safe no matter where you are. At least with gators, you're fine if you are indoors or in a tree. <laughs> um, but uh, like with gators, you're, you're technically in the clear as long as you are on land and not super close to water. Like they're not hunting you. Um, but with these guys... Uh, there, there is no, there's nowhere to hide. Uh, they are apex predators and uh, only really need to worry about parasites and diseases. They eat uh, mammals, all of them. No meal is too large. With their ability to unhinge their jaw and stretch their skin and organs to many times their normal size, pythons can swallow and digest anything that they manage to kill. With a mouth full of up to 120 sharp teeth and a 20-foot body of pure strangling muscle, it can manage to kill pretty pretty much anything that's in its habitat. Like, I feel like a bear is a, a or a tiger would be a problem, and then everything else is like okay, it's uh, it's free game. Uh, depending on the meal, they can eat once every two months, sometimes going for as long as a year and a half without eating. 
And this is done because their digestive system essentially switches off once they pass their last meal. Uh, because of this, when they swallow the next meal, new food, uh, their whole digestive system it, it is rebuilt. It, it, it boots back up. It goes in, undergoes an extreme makeover. Its heart rate and oxygen consumption increases. Its heart actually increases in mass. Uh, it generates more stomach acid and basically rebuilds its stomach and intestines in response to having swallowed this new this new meal. And so it, it can take as long as two weeks to digest a meal. And then after that, it's good to go for months at a time. Which is uh, which is interesting. I remember um, for with crocodiles, if their metabolism goes too slow, the food will just rot in their stomachs. Um, but the big thing with this with the python is it uh, generating more stomach acid uh, in order to to get things moving. Episode two of Breaking Bad style, get that get that acid going to work. Um. And I will leave it at that. I feel like everything else I have written here is all about the major fact by accident. Okie dokie. I'm calling the major fact invasion of the swamp snatchers. Yeah. Makes sense. So Burmese pythons are an infamous invasive species in South Florida. From 1996 to, to 2006... That's 10 years. Over 90,000 Burmese pythons were imported into the U.S. for the pet trade. That's a lot. It's too many. Too many. Too many. Uh, Hurricane Andrew in 1992 destroyed a python breeding facility and zoo, allowing escaped snakes to populate the Everglades. That's crazy. You, you, have to he you hear a lot about like the pet trade... People like would go and like buy them and then uh, they would get really big and you're like, well, I, this is too big. 10 feet. That's, that was, that was large enough, but now it's like 13, 14, <laughs> 10 feet. feet. I was fine with perfect pet 11 unacceptable. Get this monster There's out of my house. Too many. <laughs> yeah. So like, and then they would just release them. And I mean, 90,000 pythons coming in, if like 12% of those released are released, then it's not good. But I have to imagine several, like a lot of pythons being released all at once is a really bad, is probably the nexus level event. Especially one, a, a definite breeding population because it was a breeding facility. You just released yes. a whole operating community of pythons yeah so that was that was the avengers level threat that started it all so today we have a reached a minimum sustainable population in the wild in south florida which means there's enough out there to keep going indefinitely so over 1300 individuals have been caught in the everglades and there are believed to be thousands in still left. Uh, so they're, they're, they are genetically diverging from their Southeast Asian kin. A genetic study in 2017 found that the python population consists of a hybrid of Burmese and Indian pythons. Indian python is what Ka is. Oh. Uh -huh. Although he's way too big to be an Indian python. So why are pythons in the Everglades a problem? What's the big deal? What's one more snake in the Everglades? The Everglades is lousy with them anyway. I can think of lots of things, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, as with many invasive species, pythons are throwing off the delicate balance of the environment around them. So these animals live in the Everglades uh the, the, the animals that currently live in the, the, that are supposed to be in the Everglades, aren't adapted to live alongside these hulking snakes. You mean they, that so, now they're adapted to live inside these hulking snakes? Yeah. 
So predators are struggling to compete with them. And prey is struggling to get the heck away from them <laughs> uh, or to maintain their populations with a new predator in, in the zone of operation. So Everglades mammals, including rabbits, possums, raccoons, bobcats, and deer have declined in population by 90% when you compare the pre-population, pre-python populations to post-python populations. That's pretty bad considering that they only have to eat like three times a year. And rabbits in particular are like down 100%. They're all gone. All of them. 100% <laughs> of rabbits are gone. No, it probably means from the Everglades, from a per, like particular zone yeah, in the I'm Everglades. Not, I'm not near the Everglades, so I, I'm allowed probably to Probably like rabbits. Everglades National Parks. I, but I've never seen science say 100% of anything. Yeah, hundred percent doesn't exist in science. I don't think it's not a it's not a number, it's not a science number. It's too sure of itself, too definite, too absolute, and yeah. exhausting. Yeah, and only a Sith deals in absolute. Only a Sith, exclusively Sith, absolutely only Sith deal with an absolute. <laughs> um, so birds have also taken a hit, including the endangered wood stork. And then also the rare and endangered Florida panther is also threatened by the snakes, which eat its main sources of food. It likes rabbits, and you ate all the rabbits. Now I'm going to eat you. Because I feel like a, a Flor Florida panthers are small. And I, if a python saw one, I feel like it's just right on the menu. But snakes start out small, so maybe they get, they get a chance. So why are python... Difficult to deal with. While they don't belong in the Everglades, they certainly thrive in the subtropical environment. So it turns out this wet and dry season, warm climate is kind of similar to home. The, the wetlands and hardwood hammocks of the Everglades provide optimal environments for pythons to hunt and breed. Recent studies have found that they enjoy like elevated hardwood hammocks over the marshy wetlands, but they'll hang out in a wetland if they gotta. So young pythons can disappear into tall grass or water, making them elusive prey for predators that, that could hunt them when they're small. And uh, as an invasive species, uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife has given permission to take and kill pythons all year round and it's illegal to release pythons you've caught or purchased. They're only protected by anti-animal cruelty laws, which all animals are protected by. So you can't, I don't know, like... Skin it alive. Attach it to a helicopter blade and uh, let that thing fly around the room. But you could do uh, it to like a cockroach. So I don't know what, the, what are the standards here for animal cruelty for, by the Florida Fish and Wildlife. Probably something with it to do with central nervous systems. I would be interested uh, to see their criteria. I think all animals are like protected under anti cruelty, but like no one's gonna get like fined or arrested for flicking a cockroach twenty times. Or for boiling a lobster alive or I don't know embarrassing a fish while it flops around and dies. And suffocate slowly after you've caught it. That's pretty inhumane. Well, we, That's pretty cool. We've talked about the um, bullseye snakehead, which they say the humane way to kill it is to put it on ice, which is seems slow. I was, but you're not allowed to throw snakeheads back, just like you're not allowed to throw a uh, python back. So just, it's probably like long sustained pain like you can't kill it by like sticking a thousand needles into it can you do that to a cockroach though you do you can do one needle and it's for butterflies that's true you do pin butterflies um there is a bounty program that offers cash money to python hunters if you become a python removal agent you are required to wear a cool hat by me, <laughs> uh, 
but if you if you become a Python removal agent, you will be paid an hourly rate of between thirteen to eighteen per hour, which is like okay. It's not that much. But you receive a bonus for snakes you catch on based on size. So a four footer is fifty bucks with an additional twenty five bucks for each foot beyond that. So an eight footer is f- 150 bucks. I saw, well, back, like this was years ago. Um, they caught like an, a 17 or 18 foot Python and those guys were awarded a thousand dollars, but maybe it was like a contest or something like that. But I remember walking away from that going like there are snake bounty hunters that are earning a thousand dollars per snake. They kill. Um, and obviously most, uh, most, pythons are not 18 feet long but no but they also do they'll like do derbies and challenges where you like have a competition for a weekend to see who can get the biggest one and sometimes those cash prizes are different or more interesting more more intense larger you could even say that's a that sounds like a a pretty cool job you just go around the everglades in an airboat and a shot with a shotgun I don't know how you kill them. Um, and presumably just fire into the water when you see a python and then earn yourself a cool 150 bucks. Uh, it's a lot of... Oh, so I watched videos and it's a lot of like people driving around until they see like, did you see that? And then the camera will look to where they looked and no, there's nothing there. And they're like, yep, there, there's one there. Well, what? How do you see that? And then they just run into the bushes and jump on a 15-foot snake. They jump onto so, it? Yeah. They'll, like, grab it. Just shoot it with your gun. Well, because they'll just – sometimes it's just movement in the bush. And you could get in trouble if you shoot something that you're not supposed to shoot. Ah, man, yeah. But uh, jumping on it sounds like a really bad idea. Yeah, because you could get in trouble if you jump on something. You're not supposed to jump. That's pretty on. cruel and inhumane, huh? <laughs> I don't care about. I mean, like, what if you jump on a 15 foot crocodile? Yeah, or a hapless swimmer. You know, just so, just someone uh, just someone taking an evening swim in the Everglades. You don't want to jump. So on a them. lot of time, it's not in the water. Usually, it's in like tall grass. They're hunting these snakes. Okay. I was imagining them going around on an airboat. But it's like pure, like re- when you look at the videos of them hunting these snakes, it is like inhospitable land for a human. It's perfect for a snake that can like squeeze through, just like go into like thick grass. But it's really hard to hunt them because they, they, they live where you just cannot get around very easily. Yeah. Like knee high water to knee like chest high gr- sawgrass. Yeah, this the more we th- think about it, the less cool of a job this sounds like. I, it, it's only cool if I get to to ride around in an airboat with like a button da- with a shirt that's buttoned down all the way to the middle and a big crocodile tooth in the uh, necklace and a yeah. and a double barreled shotgun, just kind of like eyes peeled for a. Sl- a large slithering form in the in the murky Everglades waters. I would much re- th- th- that's cool. Uh, hacking my way through thorns and sawgrass and spiders and uh, equally deadly snake smaller snakes is no. That's not that's not cool at all. So there was a Vice video that was like, "What are what are Flor- what what's Florida doing to like?" to curb the uh, this dangerous python population, they're unleashing an even more deadly creature, Floridians, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> shut up, Vice. And second of all, even, like, no matter... So, like, they'll have, like, challenges, and they'll take 65 out of the... In, in, one, in one week or whatever the length of the challenge is, they'll get 65. But like one female will have 60 eggs in her belly. So like you let one female go and it completely undoes, undoes what you did in this challenge. 
and also these the hunters go out and they hunt where they can get but there could be thousands of snakes hiding where people can't really access very easily uh, without special equipment and budgets so it's it's really difficult to get rid of these snakes yeah what you need is a drone with a flamethrower on it <laughs> heat seeking drone with a flame yeah thrower. infrared vision drone that would not work because it's cold blooded <laughs> 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 never mind um so yeah you're just gonna need to have some sharp eyes and uh that sounds better. That sounds like the best f- form of that job is is drone hunting while eating a sandwich it's, instead of being out there in the thick of it. Because I didn't but, mention... But, there's, but they also can burrow. Or they'll go down into burrows. I don't know if they actually dig them, but they'll make use of them. So like there was a video where... So they've released certain... Uh, Burmese pythons with tracking chips in them so they can track where they hang out to, to learn like where do these pythons go <laughs> to learn in the where, where do we send the nuke <laughs> yeah and uh, there was a video where they're like we're going to go and find the ones we're tracking and like several times it's like alright we're right over it it's somewhere in a burrow down below us and we can't get it. So even when you know where it is, sometimes you can't take it out. I was, I was half expecting you to be like, they go try to pick up the ones they tracked and they dug the trackers out. <laughs> like, the in- like freaking Indominus, <laughs> Indominus Rex. Rex. I didn't mention though that the that these are uh constrictor snakes so they don't they're not venomous they don't have fangs um they do have backwards facing teeth so that when they they bite and latch on to something um and those teeth help them stay latched and then they wrap their bodies around uh the the prey and crush its bones and suffocate it relatively quickly uh it's not it's certainly not painless, but it is fast. Um, and uh, so that's why they're so big and so muscular. It's because they don't rely on venom. And so jumping on one, not, not knowing what you saw there in the bush and then just, just leaping. Oh, man, that just sounds like such a bad idea. Because with if you get bit, if you think it's a rattlesnake and you go in there and you get bit by a rattlesnake, you can... You can deal with that. There's anti-venom. You can uh, hack your arm off or whatever. Um, but if if you get wrapped up by a python, the, the python has to die in... You have like a minute or something to kill that python before you die. And even then, you're... Not really. Um because we have what we in the in the science community call thumbs. So we have a little bit of an advantage over your average rabbit. Yeah, but the okay, and maybe if it's like an 8 foot these snake. These guys are going out with with buddies. Yeah, if it's like an which are unwrapping them actively. If it's an 8 foot snake, then you're probably I'm talking like if it's like a 15 or f- footer or or longer. You jump into that, suddenly now you have this snake head latched onto you. And then it, it, it's an ambush predator. So then it wraps itself around you really quickly. Uh, and yes, hopefully you have friends that can run up and kill it. Well, they, they would grab it by the tail and pull it, pull it out. You're taking away length of body for it to use to strangle. So yeah, you definitely don't want it to get around your neck and stuff, but. Uh, but also they're also usually in flight mode when, when they get jumped on. So they're not in Same. the ambush. I'm going to kill you. So I got to wrap around you really fast mode. 
But I wouldn't want to get bit by one for sure. No. Because they latch on. They're very. I saw a video of uh, a guy who had one like on his forearm or whatever, and there were like three other guys like trying to pry its jaws open, and there was nothing. Like it's not like a dog's jaw. It's very flexible. So like they're pulling on it and it's like pulling on like leather. There's not there's they're not able to get their fingers under anything to pull. So it's just stretching. Yeah. And this jaw is tightly clamped. So that's not pleasant. No. And now there's thousands of them. Yep. Burmese, I mean. They're everywhere. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, like, I don't know of any, like, human deaths by anaconda constrictor snake in Florida. No, I didn't look up the, the statistics. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, like, and I, I, I do it too, just like, oh, the, there's all these dangerous animals and. They're not. When you look at the statistics, it's they're really not all that uh, I mean, they're dangerous, but they it, your chances of encountering one, let alone being killed by one or even injured, is really, really low. Like I've never, uh, I've lived there's... in Florida my whole life, and I've I lived. I've lived 10 minutes from the Everglades my whole life, and I've never seen one of those in the wild. So, uh, so you got anything else? That's all I got. All right. That was the Burmese Python for you out there in Podcastia. Set up shop in a new place. Pick your battles carefully and give the closest mammal a big, tight, tight hug. Like the Florida, I mean Burmese Python here in life death and taxonomy. Hey, Taxonomy Titans. I just want to remind you that we now have a Patreon. Patrons can see full video episodes and get shoutouts on the show. But ultimately, it's a way for you to help us cover some costs and get even better. Still, reviews are the best way to help us grow. So if you haven't left one yet, we'd really love to hear from you. As always, thanks for listening and engaging. Life, Death, and Taxonomy is my favorite in the world podcast. (laughs) That was a nice one. Give somebody a hug.